Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 21st meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2017. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones, and as meeting papers are provided in a digital format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. Uh, we don't quite yet have a full turnout, but no apology has been received, and we'll move on to agenda item one. Uh, and the committee will take evidence on its scrutiny of building regulations and fire safety in Scotland. And can I welcome David Stewart, Policy Lead Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, uh, Kenny McKenzie, Royal Institution of Charter Surveyors in Scotland, and Denise Christie, Regional Treasurer of Fire Brigades Union Scotland. And, and I'm, thank you all for, for coming along and thank you for the written evidence that, that, that we've received. Before we, we move to some brief opening statements, uh, uh, I'd just like to make a very brief comment on behalf of, of all the committee members here this morning. The committee will today take evidence on its scrutiny of building regulation of fire safety in Scotland. Members will recall we began our inquiry into building regulations in February, but following the tragic events at Grenfell Tower in London, we extended our inquiry to include fire safety. I want to extend the committee's thoughts and sympathies to all those affected by the Grenfell Tower fire, and I thought it was appropriate just to, to set the context by which we're, we're taking this evidence. So we may have had, had you in front of us anyway, because we were doing the inquiry into building standards, but uh, it, it's uh, timious that, that, that we we bring that forward to look at fire safety in particular. So thank you for coming along this morning. That said, I believe there are some opening statements. We'd be, we'd be grateful to have them. I don't know who's going to open up on behalf of the witnesses. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. happy to go first. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to uh, give evidence. Um, as you said, I represent the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations. And I wanted to briefly say a little bit about the, the members in the sector we represent before going on to talk about fire safety. Um, associations provide about 11 to 12 per cent of Scotland's housing. They provide housing for affordable rent before, below the market level, and they tend to do that to people on, for people on low incomes or who are perhaps vulnerable in some ways. Um, they're all not-for-profit, and the vast majority are registered charities. They have a long history of tenants having a, a significant role. Uh, most, if not all, will have tenants on their boards, their management boards, uh, often in a majority. Uh, to then go on and say a little bit about fire safety, um, first of all, uh, on building standards, uh, I know that um, the Ministerial Working Group, having asked all councils and housing associations for information on cladding on multi-storey buildings, have been able to confirm that none of them have combustible material of the, the type um, that was found in, in Grenfell eh, and that's thought to have contributed to the terrible tragedy. And I suppose from that point of view, that would suggest that that, that aspect of building standards is, is doing its, its job, you might think. Um, I then want to say a little bit about what our members have told us about their working relationship with the, the fire service and, and what they routinely do to help um, tenants and maintain fire safety. Um, Following the tragedy, we surveyed members and we've had a, a number of members' meetings to discuss the issue. Um, we found that routinely the fire service will uh, have quarterly visits to housing associations, multi-stories. They will uh, identify any issues or concerns and these will then be followed up between the housing association and the fire service. The fire service also make themselves available and are, are very happy to provide um, home visits to housing association tenants. And many of our members um, make, a, make it a, a policy to make tenants aware of this. In fact, one whom I met yesterday have it as a condition of their tenancy sign-up that they ask that the, the tenant has a, a visit and receives advice in the first couple of months of their tenancy. And beyond that, associations have told us that their staff themselves will provide them um, have uh, daily checks where they'll have work round, walk rounds and check for blockages, obstructions, and look at the, the dry risers. 
Uh, another issue I, I wanted to highlight, and I'll, I'll try and be brief, is um, the importance of communication with tenants. Um, while obviously this, this inquiry is about um, building standards, members have been telling us that they feel uh, communication with tenants and the human aspect is at least as important as, as building uh, standards. And uh, they've provided fire safety leaflets to tenants. Um, they regularly provide updates and advice on uh, fire safety through newsletters and electronically. Um, and as I said, they, they promote the opportunity to, to have uh, visits by the fire service. And one final issue I, I wanted to raise, um, you'll be aware that there's a Scottish Government consultation on, on fire safety standards in buildings. We, we very much welcome this and we're, we're keen to participate. It's very important that lessons are learned and anything that can be done to improve standards is. And one issue that's come up in this area from our members is, at the moment, there's no requirement for fire alarms in uh, owner-occupied buildings. Uh, many multi-stories, of course, will have owner-occupiers through the right to buy. And something that can be a, a particular concern is that people might buy a former social home and replace the, the fire door with a door that's not actually fire rated. Members believe this is quite a concern and, and we would like to see that considered as part of the inquiry and also part of the Scottish Government consultation. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Stewart, thank you very much. Mr Mackenzie, do you want to? Hi. Um, good morning. Yes, uh, I'm here representing the RICS this morning and I think I've, I've been here before. Just to clarify, I don't actually, I'm not employed by the RICS. I'm actually employed by City and Council. I'm a member and I pass um, professional group chair. Uh, but my first thing I want to just say is a sincere apology because the RICS didn't manage to get a formal response in, in time and, and that comes from our head office. Uh, I'm sorry about that. There was sickness and holidays and, and a bit of miscommunication. So really just a sincere apology. We can forward something um, as, as soon as possible if you still wish that and I'll, I'll we'll still we'll do that. Part Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other further comments, Mr. No, McKenzie? No, that's fine. That okay. was just uh, Denise Christie. Morning. Um, my name is Denise Christie. I'm the Scottish Regional Official for the, the Fire Brigades Union, who represent firefighters and operational fire control members throughout Scotland. Can I just start off by saying, Convener, that the Fire Brigades Union has watched the developments recently with a mixture of horror, anger, and pride. The appalling tragedy at Grenfell Tower is already the worst UK fire disaster of recent times. And the full death toll is still not, not yet known. It's appalling to think that a fire on this scale and this loss of life can take place in the richest borough in the capital city of one of the richest nations in the world. And a key task for the FBU now is to identify how this was able to happen. FBU members will have shared the feelings and sorrow and horror of the loss of life on such a scale. Our condolences go to the families of those killed and our thoughts are with those who survived. The Union stands in solidarity with the tenants and the residents of Grenfell Tower and we will work with them to uncover why this horrible, terrible tragedy occurred and what could have happened uh, done to prevent it. Uh, the FPU, we've already started to pull together the key facts and issues surrounding this incident. As in all such cases, the FPU will make a thorough investigation as to what happened and why. The most obvious question is how an incident on such a scale can even take place in 2017 in the capital city of one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Our investigation will address all factors which will have impacted on this incident. This includes the issues of the building itself, including any alterations made to it, fire safety issues and the operational planning and response. The work, will, the work may well shape the fire and rescue service and profession for the years to come in Scotland. And the FBU's priority has always been firefighter and public safety. And we will continue that campaign in order to mitigate any future disasters 
like that of the Grenfell Tower. And we really appreciate the opportunity here to come and speak today and give evidence. Thank you. Um, thank you to all our witnesses for, for their opening remarks. Um, let me just start off by by looking at some of the FBU evidence that was submitted, which was very detailed and, and very helpful. I think I'd best describe it as both reassuring and challenging at the same time. So I'm going to go and ask about some of the qu challenges that, that are raised by the evidence, but I should put on record the reassuring bit in the first place, I suppose, just, just to give some balance to that. So the FBU evidence... Um, believes that the, the greater clarity provided by the Scottish building standards has meant that no such confusion exists in terms of the combustibility of, of cladding used in Scotland where it should be constructed from non-combustible materials, and that's crystal clear. Uh, but the terminology in England is of limited combustibility, and that leads to what we saw in Grenfell. And I'm very pleased to see that the FBU believes that the chances of a similar fire occurring in Scotland are indeed minimised. So... I wanted to put that on the record because I thought that was important as we go and ask some of the more challenging questions in, in, in relation to, to your evidence. Um, the FBU draws a, a clear distinction between a, a light-touch audit of fire safety in tower blocks uh, versus an intrusive inspection and makes some suggestions around uh, how the lessons that are now being learned in London in relation to doing the intrusive inspection regimes uh, there is exposing deficiencies that were previously unknown um, and the, the light touch audit just didn't cut it at all uh, from reading the FBU's evidence. You suggest something similar might be appropriate in Scotland. Could you say a little bit more about that? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you, Convener. Um, when the Grenfell Tower tragedy happened, London Fire Brigade... Um, looked at the fire safety inspecting officers and asked them to go in and do an intrusive inspection of, uh, of properties. And if you remember, um, it was the, some buildings and some high-rise buildings in London were evacuated. But, and it wasn't because that the cladding was an issue, it was because fire safety precautions were an issue, whether it was fire doors or fire safety alarms, um, and that was due to an intrusive inspection. So I think the key point here is that the Scottish Government, the Ministerial Government Review, is looking at the cladding, but we would ask them to expand that review to have some intrusive uh, uh, inspect, ins inspections within properties in Scotland that could potentially highlight other fire, fire safety issues. If they are highlighted, then we would be made aware of them and action could be taken to try and mitigate that. But that's only if there were you know, um, issues in there. The intrusive inspections may come out positive and they may come out saying, you know, the standards are great and everything's fine. But the light touch audit, we have had fire safety inspection officers going in there trying to do their job, uh, but with a minimum amount of time to do that intrusive inspection. OK, that, that, that's helpful. Um, Mr Stewart, in a moment I'll bring you in because I'm sure you want to say something about the role of housing associations in, in any work that, that you do with the, the, the fire service. But Ms Christie, can I ask you to maybe just tease out a little bit more about what intrusive inspections might mean? And apologies for going off on a slight tangent here, but, for example, care homes in Scotland are... And I'm not talking about fire safety, I'm talking about levels of care. Care homes in Scotland are inspected in two ways. There's a, there's a risk-based assessment of the measure of scrutiny that's needed of each care home, but there's also the occasional spot check without warning where the care inspector can turn up, they can say, shows all your paperwork, they can talk to staff, they can talk to residents, they can talk to families, and they dig down deep without any warning at all. And they just arrive on the doorstep of the care home, as it should be, because that, that drives up standards across the board, not knowing when that inspection is going to take place. So when the FBU talk about intrusive inspections, I don't know if you're talking about a, a one-off piece of work or you're referring to perhaps as an ongoing programme of fire safety in Scotland, every landlord who has a tower block as part of their stock should know there's an opportunity that the fire service will turn up and do this intrusive inspection, which could help to drive up standards across the sector. So, sorry to push on this a little bit more. Could you flesh out what you mean by intrusive inspections? Would it be a, a one-off exercise? Would it be a rolling programme? Would it be embedded into best practice going forward for the long term? 
it, it would be similar to what happened in London Fire Brigade and that was a one-off inspection. We appreciate that it's going to be timely, it's going to be costly, it's going to take a lot of hours, uh, working hours to do those inspections. But if we have that one-off intrusive inspections with a variety of buildings across Scotland, that's when we can have a clear picture of, of if there are any real issues within those intrusive uh, inspections. And if they are, we can look at what the issues are and look at recommendations to, to sort those issues. So it wouldn't be an ongoing intrusive inspections continually. We appreciate that's going to be, uh, it's going to be quite timely and, 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 and quite costly uh, to continue to do that, but it would be a one-off inspection. That's helpful. Mr Stewart, I know, for example, in my own constituency, NG homes are establishing a a tenant and resident led fire safety panel because they've got a lot of high rises within their stock and they see that as an opportunity. They would say they're already very close to their tenants and residents, but it's an opportunity not to be complacent and go further. How can we be confident that across all social housing stock in Scotland, there's that systematic approach by housing associations to make sure they're working closely with the fire service and they've got their fire safety spot on? Would the SFH have anything to fear? from a one-off intrusive inspection exercise? No, I don't think so. I, I think um, that would be something that would seem helpful and, and welcome just to provide reassurance to, to tenants, which I think is key, but, but also to provide um, re reassurance to the, the wider public. Um, something I didn't... Um, Mention in my introductory remarks that I shouldn't should have is that housing associations generally, and I'm sure local authorities too, uh, commission uh, fire risk assessments on a fairly regular basis, and, and that's um, outside experts being commissioned to come in and and look at properties and, and highlight any issues that they need rectified. Although it's consultants or companies rather than the the fire service, but I think the fire service providing a, a similar function and also the fact that that could happen, you know, with, without um, announcement it would would be a, a welcome way of uh, providing reassurance about safety standards. That's helpful. Uh, one final question. I know my Deputy Commissioner Lee Smith wants to come and follow some of this up. Again, the FBU evidence talks about um, uh, falling between two stools in terms of uh, assessing for fire safety in relation to, to new build properties where sometimes they're partially occupied uh, and it's not clear whether the builders and the whole verif verification scheme around the construction process is dealing with fire safety or the fire service is coming and looking at it because there's no set point in time by which it's agreed that you know, at date X, at this part of the, the, the build process, the fire service will come in and interrogate the fire safety of new build properties. And there's a grey area there. Could you say a little bit more about, about that? Yeah, I think when you're looking at new builds, you will find that sometimes during a new, new build programme, you will have residents moving in before the new build is completed. So that provides some difficulties for the fire service to go in there and do that initial um, intrusive uh, uh, inspection of, of the fire safety. So it's very difficult for them to see along the building period what fire safety measures have been put in place. So what we recommend that would be quite helpful during that period if the building contractors could either invite the fire service in during each stage of that process or if they could even take some pictures um, behind wall, behind ceilings that's find that the fire brigade will find very difficult to reach. Thank you for answering that. I specifically raised that question because our inquiry is not exclusive to fire safety and, and tower blocks. We're looking at you know, wider issues about uh, the building process, building warrants and verification schemes. And I wanted to give a nod to that in the evidence that the FBU submitted. Um, Elaine Smith. Thanks, convener, and thanks to the panel for coming along and joining us this morning. Um, I would intend, with the convener's indulgence, to come back later to some questions for Mr Stewart and Mr McKenzie, time permitting. But could I just specifically ask some questions about um, the FBU submission. So, uh, Denise, on, I think it's about the fourth page of your, your submission under the section on inspections and inspectors, uh, you talk about the, the changes to the Fire and Rescue Service over recent years um, and a number of change factors 
uh, having an impact. And also, you go on to talk about Scotland losing 24% of its uniform fire safety inspecting officers since 2013-14, and also losing non-uniformed inspecting officer posts. I wonder if you could possibly um, expand a bit more on that evidence. What kind of changes are we talking about? And what has been the impact of losing those fire safety posts? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, yes, we recently, um, uh, Fire Brigade Union asked for a, an FY to the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service on the number of fire safety inspecting officers that they've got. And the report came back that there's been a reduction of 24% since the introduction of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service in, in 2013. Now, that that's exactly the same trend as what's happening right across the board in the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. We've seen a reduction of over 700 frontline firefighter posts. Those firefighters move from uh, being a firefighter in the fire service to crew managers, to watch managers, and then going into specific posts within the organisation. And fire safety uh, enforcement officers is one of them. So we see that as a direct impact of those job losses within the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. And to be blatantly honest, that's due to the £58 million reduction that we've had in the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. We've had year on year cuts to our organisation um, that, that we're finding very, very difficult to cope. And we were, we were promised that the uh, reorganisation from the eight former brigades into one Fire and Rescue, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service would not impact on the front line but it absolutely is impacting on the front line. And now we're seeing cuts happening to our fire safety inspection um, officers right across the country. And we're hearing from our members that they're finding it very difficult to complete fire safety inspections in the amount of time that they've got to do it and with a thorough investigation that those inspections deserve. So it's really disappointing and it's really concerning to hear. Thanks, convener. So in, in your evidence, you're going to say that um, one way to improve the standard of fire risk assessment is to create more fire safety inspecting officers posts. So uh, you obviously feel that it's a matter of some urgency? Absolutely, um, especially on the back of, of Grenfell Tower fire. It's not just about the fire service isn't just about responding to incidents. It's about protection and preventing incidents as well. So when we go, uh, whenever there's a fire, we will have fire uh, uh, safety inspection officers um, and, and fire investigation officers going to find out what the cause of that fire is. We are now um, uh, seeing further, uh, uh, further recommendations from the fire service to reduce our fire investigation officers as well as our fire safety inspecting officers. Now, that's not detailed in, in, in the report here. But there's a trend there. There's a reduction in frontline firefighters, a reduction in fire investigation officers, and a reduction in fire safety enforcement officers. And that's really worrying for the Fire Brigade Union. Thanks, Kevin. Okay. Um, thank you. Alexander Stewart. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Panel, you, you raise concerns about the, the poor quality of fire risk assessments uh, and, and how these risk assessments uh, have that. Now, when we're talking about involvement, of the, the tenants and residents within, and you've touched on some of that this morning, Mr. Stewart, and what you said initially. How do they engage and how do they buy into this whole process so that they have the confidence uh, in the properties they're living in uh, that have had these risk assessments done on them? Uh, because as I say, in the, some of the information you've got, you indicate that there's a poor quality there and what needs to be done to ensure that they feel safer. Uh, because if there's a, an assessment being carried out and that assessment isn't, uh, of a high enough standard uh, or quality, then that automatically gives uh, some anxiety. Um, I, I don't think, I, I think it might have been Denise that, that had some concerns about um, quality and, and the depth um, of the fire risk assessment. As I said, um, associations commission outside agencies to, to carry out these, these assessments, and, and I would hope that they they are of sufficient quality, uh, and then associations act on them. As far as tenant engagement goes, um, associations um, provide information, and there's been a lot of examples of um, newsletters being provided, letters being sent out to 
to all tenants, um, partly providing reassurance, but also providing a, advice. So a, a mixture of saying what the Housing Association and the fire service are, are doing to ensure safety, but also providing some, some advice to tenants on what, what they can do to ensure the building's safe. I, I'd be happy to, to share some examples of that with the committee if, if that would be helpful. Um, Another thing I think that's key on, on tenant engagement and maybe related to what the convener said about NG homes is just having um, engagement and, and that's partly about making tenants aware that the fire service are, are available to come and do home visits and, and make assessments but also think the idea of having a panel for a a two-way communication is, is a very good idea. Um, one of the shocking things about Grenfell that's not so much related to the, the physical issues that might have caused the fire is the fact that tenants had raised issues on a number of occasions and over a period of time. And you would really not want to think or, or believe that would happen in Scotland, but it's something we mustn't be complacent about. So it's, it's something to look at going forward, I think. And I, and I think that you, you highlight the, the importance of the fire safety visit that can be provided by the fire service yes. that, that gives that assurance about the exits and uh, having a plan, uh, your smoke detectors, whatever that may well be, yes. that's there to try and support all of that uh, and to give them that assurance that should something happen, they are going to be protected. Uh, yes. But I think if, there, if there's a communication breakdown, and you know, we can't take for granted that there's not a communication breakdown yeah. in some of the organisations in Scotland, we hope that's not the case, but I think that would be useful to try and see if that is the case uh, and that individuals had not had uh, concerns uh, expressed or, or taken mm. forward. Uh, because, you know, we, we learned from the disaster uh, that, that that was one of the main criteria, uh, that if it had been addressed earlier in the day, then some things could have been changed. Yeah. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Convener. Um, thank you, panel, for coming along. I just want to ask a couple of questions about the Ministerial Working Group and the role of the RICS. But before I do so, I want to just pick up on some line of questioning from the convener. In the Fire Brigades Union um, evidence, you, uh, you state correctly that the current building standards in relation to fire are that thermal insulation materials situated or exposed within an external wall cavity or in a cavity formed by external wall cladding shall, should be constructed of non-combustible materials. But then you go to, on to highlight whether, in fact, the aluminium facing cladding panels that were used in Grenfell Tower um, and any um, combustible material within the two sheets of metal that make up the cladding would actually be prohibited by that definition. I mean, I, this appears to be to me to be more than a semantic point in the sense that that um, that gap between the two metal sheets is not an external wall cavity as such. Is there a, actually a problem here? It's a question for all the panel, perhaps Kenny as well, to yeah. look at. I mean, this this cladding material. Um, I would say sneaked onto the market. I'm not aware of it. And it, it. In fact, there was a building to the west of Edinburgh, a student recently completed student block of flats, which had specified a material by the manufacturer of the company who made this product uh, to be a, just a single sheet material. And somehow, without anybody knowing or anybody being informed, they replaced it with this insulating material. I think on the, the, the pretext that this was a better material for insulation and, and might be a more robust material. But uh, no, I've never heard of anybody being aware of this material. And until this fire, I, I couldn't believe when I saw this fire that that, that had happened because it just doesn't happen. Cladding is solid, it's whatever, and it doesn't burn. And this external, which is not really, even, it's just a rain screen cladding. It's, it's, it's not, it's there just keep the rain out, really. That's all. Keep the water off. Part of the whole construction for insulation and structure. But it was a new material to me. I'd never came across it, and I don't think many people had. We were, we were all asking each other about it and hadn't been aware of it. And certainly, when we looked into the, the, the building in the, the student flats in the west of Edinburgh, where it had been used just in small infill, similar, I think, to the new Princess, Princess, Princess Elizabeth, the hospital in Glasgow anyway, similar situation, it had been used there. 
Nobody's seen it at risk. It was in isolation, um, but they have replaced it quite rightly. Uh, but I wasn't aware of this material before um, the, this fire in London. I wasn't aware of it. And we checked back our records, and as far as we know, what was approved on the plans was a, a solid three mil thick metal panel similar to all the other panels used on the building uh, and they had used this different panel it was a coloured panel they've now replaced it um, uh, the, the, the student flats companies replaced it which is great but I wasn't aware of this material before and wasn't aware of what it was and now having looked into it no it has been on the market for a few years um, and it's hopefully been withdrawn but it's not a common material at all and I think that's why when we, we've been working with the, with the Building Standards Division of, of, your, of your government, uh, looking, and as of other authorities, looking at all the high-rise in Scotland as a building control authority in Edinburgh, and we've been digging out all our old plans, and it's not really specified anywhere. It has sneaked in a couple of times, but in consultation with the fire brigade, we didn't feel it where it was actually using these small panels it was ever going to be a risk, but quite rightly they did remove it and replace it. But there's other issues as well, if you don't mind me continuing, and I think it, it, it's, it's further to what Denise has said. Um, one of the other materials that's used behind the rain screen cladding is a polyurethane phenolic um, material, um, plastic foam, whatever you want to call it. And those are described as non-combustible, a low combustibility. Uh, and a lot of products which have been used in recent years in Scotland, deemed to be non-combustible, have recently been retested, and the manufacturers are now finding they're coming in from a class O, non-combustibility class, to a class 1, which is a slightly different surface spread of flame classification. I don't want to get too technical, but it's it still will have limited combustibility, but it doesn't quite meet this non-combustibility standard which is going to open up a huge can of worms if it is deemed there is a risk. Now, in saying that, you have within your, your construction of your wall to get out into this virtually no an hour's fire resistance to get to that material. But it, it, it does throw up a few questions that you've got accredited um, test, no, fire testing centres which are accredited by the government and they're approved and they've been testing materials and giving them a classification, and now they're retesting them. Now, it might be a different test centre. They've been retested, and we're finding out they've been given a lower classification, which is throwing up some issues at the moment. And a lot of what is built, it's in materials passing things. It's specialist companies, manufacturers, go to specialist testing centres, and they get these materials tested, and then they put that in the manufacturer's literature as you know, combustible, low combustibility, um, and then non-combustible. And that classification is determined by a, a, a BS476 um, fire test that should be carried out in a lab, on a rig, to rigorous standards. But it's whether there's edge issues and there's different issues, and it's now been retested and there's been a lower classification. I think we're going to find more of this happening. Um, Sorry, I've gone on a little bit. Yeah, I'm just going to say, uh, yes, sir. Very helpful, given the, the written evidence we've received from uh, yeah. Denise Christie. It would just be helpful for, to you say more about that. I know you were calling for an explicit change to uh, the definition of what a non-combustible material is. So we welcome that that's the situation in Scotland, but you're wanting greater clarity and more, a more explicit statement of what that actually means. Yeah, if, if I can refer you to the FBU's submission, if we would talk about fire research, and this is a really important point. Um, fundamental research into the fire per performance of modern buildings materials, that's been slashed. And from what we're actually seeing now is that many materials coming onto the market um, have not been studied and the demands for better and better thermal insulation of buildings is driving innovation in the construction industry but unfortunately most of the best insulation materials are also are also easily ignited so one of the recommendations from our submission um, is to make sure that research into combustible materials and new modern building materials that are coming onto the market, funding is being made available for that so we can research that before we have another catastrophe like like Grenfell. 
you that. That's so, very helpful. Uh, Mr. Stewart, before I bring Mr. Whiteman back in, Mr. Stewart, did you want to add anything to any of that? Just really, I obviously don't have the same level of technical knowledge as my two colleagues. Um, we're aware that um, no um, social housing has, has material um, regarded as combustible from what the Ministerial Working Group has done. But maybe just to add that you'll all be aware that um, energy efficiency is a, a really big issue and, and housing associations have invested a lot um, in energy efficiency, partly for carbon targets, but mainly for the, the comfort um, of their, their tenants. So I suppose it's important, I would say, in a, any review or, or consideration of fire safety that um, it doesn't work against or, or conflict with energy efficiency standards and that both are, are seen as uh, important uh, things for tenant comfort and, and safety. Okay, I, I just uh, apologies, Mr. White, but I, I did notice from the SFHA submission that you thankfully said that none of your members ha who got back to you reported that any of this cladding was, was used mm -hmm. uh, in any of their stock. But you did actually see those who got back to you, which suggests that not every member got back to you. Could you maybe say a little bit more about that? Uh, yeah, um, I, that was maybe not well phrased. Um, we ran a, a, an initial and very quick survey of members to ask about um, insulation used in, in buildings, uh, but also work that they did with the fire service and, and what they did to communicate with tenants. And like most surveys, not, not every member responded. However, I understand that through the Ministerial Working Group and the work of the, the Building Standards Authority, that every housing association has responded to the government and confirmed that they, they don't have any cladding of that type on, on high-rise buildings. That's exactly what I wanted to double-check, because yeah. that was our understanding, but it was yeah. Dubai to the way that, that, well, that was worded. Mr Whiteman, my apologies. want to follow up on some of uh, Yes, just to follow up my original question then, do you, would you uh, agree, therefore, that the current building standard, as, as written, uh, would in fact allow the kind of cladding that was used in Grenfell to be used in Scotland, given that it doesn't, the combustible material is not within a wall cavity? Do we need to tighten that up, as the Fire Brigade Union oh, suggest? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I have to explain. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, it's, it's a definition, isn't it? It's a limited combustible within England and the non-combustible within Scotland. And like I previously said, research needs to be done into those materials. Uh, and, you know, that could potentially be done through this further intrusive fire safety inspection audits where the intrusive part of that is actually potentially test testing uh, if the materials or if the, the cladding uh, uh, is combustible or, or is not. That's what previous, previously stated by my colleague here. He spoke about that some of these materials are what were previously rendered as non-combustible, but further examination potentially could make them partly, partly combustible. So I would, I would, I would argue that uh, uh, investment into fire safety inspecting officers to go out and do those intrusive inspections, along with the experts within uh, the building construction areas and along with the experts that are able to test those, those materials, and then we would have a true record of the real state of affairs that's actually out there. I think the regulations are robust. Mm. Um, there, there is maybe scope for, for more improvement, but I think the, it, it does go back to the, the sort of test and inspection regime of the manufacturer and, and what they're doing and how and making it clear how these panels and insulation materials can be used. That is already happening. And I, I think there's also from, we've found already, from the, the designers putting in new applications and new proposals, are moving away, are trying to move away from these um, insulated panels that are made from the, the foam, let us say, um, different types of foam, uh, to more genuine, solid, non-combustible materials like rock wools and things like that. But that does have an effect on insulation values. It has an effect on wall thicknesses. And then we move into other issues. 
we don't want to go back into wall ties and school walls falling down and things like that. But that there is all the, unfortunately, the building regulations do have to all come together. And quite often, when one change comes in one standard, it does have a negative effect in another standard that has to be correctly looked at and, and detailed and, and, and moved forward. But I think at the moment, in terms of the non-combustibility, it's clear. It's just what is classified as non-combustible and how that's been tested. No, I mean, I, I brought some documents here. You get global assessments. You get independent things saying, no, they're tested to the BBA approved. All proper certified, classified bodies for testing. Uh, and that's what all materials should be checked to. But somewhere along the line, mistakes have been made, I think, or maybe errors, um, not, not mistakes, that's a bad word to say, but they've maybe not been aware of the, the edge problem. I think it seems to have been the, the fire in London seems to be something to do with the fact that the edges, it was the fire was exposed at the edges rather than we test fire sort of on a plane and maybe tape up edges. Now we're leaving it exposed so that the edges are exposed. And I think because of that, it's not quite met the full non-combustibility, but it still meets the, the lower standard, which is still a very good standard. And these types of materials are, are in a, an insulated box anyway. The, the, there's in, a, a fire insulated box anyway. And, okay. Thanks, okay. and Scotland should be protected because the regulations have us at a higher standard, but I just want to clarify this again. Ms Christie, what you're saying is that whilst the regulations appear to have a higher standard, and by and large the practice means that uh, th those constructing and who are landlords in, in, in these properties are meeting that higher standard, some of the new products coming onto the market leads to a kind of vagueness where they could perhaps get round that so you would look for more explicit clarity of what we actually mean by non-combustible materials. Yes, that's absolutely correct. And just to echo what, what Kenny said, that during that process, there is a potential risk of some errors mm. being made, and the consequence of those errors could potentially be a catastrophic fire if the inspection hasn't been uh, 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 made out um, appropriately. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr Simpson? Sorry, I oh, apologies, Mr White, I thought you'd completed. No, I'm completely sorry, I haven't even got around to my substantive question here. Um, uh, it would be useful, Mr Mackenzie, perhaps, if you could write to the committee with what evidence you have about the use of materials that was previously classified zero and has gone to one. You, this, this is just sure. come in very I appreciate, recently. I yeah. appreciate that. But if you could yeah, tell us I can what do, you can do. No, that's what we were, uh, as I say, be useful. Uh, because I don't work directly with RSS, I had submitted some comments, and these were to be collated and, and sent to you. <laughs> Not and a it was problem. all done very last minute, and unfortunately, somebody was off and it didn't happen. I apologise for that. Okay. But we, we can follow up with all the information yep. we've got. So, on the, um, I wanted to ask you about the remit and work programme of the government's ministerial working group. Um, I mean, are you all content with the, 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 the remit and the membership and the work programme of the group? And what engagement have you had, and has that been satisfactory to date? Sorry, yep. The, the Fabregas Union, uh, through the STEC uh, General Secretary, Graham Smith, um, requested that we have a seat within that ministerial working group, um, but we were, we were refused a seat. Um, and the reasons being that it was because it was a, an internal ministerial working group. But we believe that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service um, also sit within that seat, which is absolutely appropriate to do. But certainly we would um, uh, we would also prefer to have a seat round about that table. And in relation to the ministerial working group, part of the submission does explain that we would like to see the remit of that group widen more in relation to, to the cladding. Um, as in our submission, we've spoke about the five tower blocks in Camden and London, where they had an intrusive inspection, were evacuated, not because of the cladding, but because of a further fire safety issues. So we, we would like to see that ministerial group widen in the terms of reference, not just in relation to cladding. Um, the way um, the SFHA has been involved in the ministerial working group is not through directly attending meetings. As Denise says, it's an, an internal government working group, but we have had a lot of engagement with uh, the, house, the Sustainable Housing Division of the Scottish Government and have had meetings uh, along with uh, COSLA and uh, 
Alacho, the, the local authority chief housing officers group, and had discussions and in, in input that way. Um, one issue which I highlighted in my opening remarks that I think we would like to see considered is while there's been look uh, at, at cladding and also there's the, the consultation on, on fire alarms and, and providing common standards and possibly enhanced standards, um, something that the associations have highlighted to us as a concern is where fire doors can be removed by owner occupiers or private landlords, mainly owner occupiers, and the concern that this could actually um, compromise fire safety. Um, and, and to put that in context, a few members have told us that they've had fairly serious fires and multi-stories, but actually the, the design of the building and, and the fire doors have done their job because they've they've been contained to that that one one building until either the fire burns out or it's extinguished by the fire service. So so I suppose that's the one issue we, we would like to highlight because associations or councils can do all the right things and uh, follow up on what the fire service or an independent auditor recommends, but at the moment they can't do anything to, to have a private owner actually take action on their property. Yeah, um, I've not personally had any direct involvement. Um, I'm not even sure if the RICS are part of it, but certainly through the local authority building standards and the RICS, we, we, would, we would comment. I, my only comment is that I think a lot of things we're discussing being a building standards surveyor aren't directly related to the building regulations. We're talking about tower blocks here, and when we start talking about tower blocks, we tend to talk about the older buildings, the 60s, 70s, 80s buildings. Even if they had a brand new fire door 40, 50 years ago, it wouldn't be working now, it would be hanging off its hinges. So obviously it, it, it relies on people like your, your, your members upgrading and continually improving. If an application comes into a local authority building standards department to upgrade a tower block, lots of that work will be exempt because it's deemed to be repair and maintenance and it, it's not really covered by the standards. The standards only apply to new buildings. They only apply to a converted building. You're not converting a tower block when you do maintenance on it. Obviously, it shouldn't fail to a greater degree, so nothing it's done should make it worse. And obviously, any local authority would make suggestions how to make improvements. But I think a lot of what we're speaking about here um, is covered either by the Fire Scotland Act, because that's risk assessment. Building control takes it to completion. Fire Scotland Act takes after that. I think local authority building standards departments are verifiers so it's really the owner's responsibility to what gets done and what happens and they say the work's done and satisfied and local authorities try and verify that and there is continual assessment uh, during the construction and hopefully things aren't covered over before they're inspected and certainly since post Grenville um, every builder out there wants to get you out and wants to talk to you and lays with you and make sure they're doing the right thing and doing extra overs to what they had to do. So there's been a huge awareness and a huge improvement in that. But I would say also that um, there's HMO legis House and Multiple Occupation legislation, there's landlords legislation out there, which is very strict on the private let side. And I think a lot of what happens there could be transferred onto the public let side because private let people, I know we, we work with these people because warrants come in for upgrading things. They're putting in retrospective sprinklers, retrospective fire alarm detection systems, upgrading fire doors, getting pack tests done every so often, getting things done. Um, so there's a lot more onerous things put on either one that has to be registered as a house for multiple occupation or a person who's a landlord of a smaller property has to comply with lots of ongoing standards and works that I don't have to in my house um, and probably you don't have to as a landlord, a private, a public landlord as such. You may well do, but it's not in legislation. Mm -hmm. okay. um, could, could I maybe just briefly follow up on that? Um, specific to that point, sorry. because I, I know you're fine. It's, it's, our Deputy Commissioner has a very specific point of clarification based on Mr McKenzie's yeah. latest comments there. 
Yeah, Mr McKenzie, I did ask actually previously about changes being made such as recladding and whether or not those would be covered. That would require a building warrant. The cladding would, but lots well, of the internal <laughs> stuff wouldn't. Right, and I think, so if I you think were what, to... Sorry, we'll just be absolutely clear. Aye. If you were to reclad, you would need you would a need a building, building warrant, warrant yes. because that concerned me about what aye. you were saying. But so much of what I think Denise has quite rightly said has become issues when they go in and look at things. Um, in terms of fire doors, either not being a fire door okay. or not fit for purpose, holes in the floor where a service has been put through, um, ventilation systems for smoke extraction not working, not being maintained, pressurisation systems that are used to keep smoke out of certain areas, buildings not balanced, not working. There's lots of other active alarm systems not working, active and passive systems. We were just relieved in relation yeah, to the cladding. Sorry, no, the we, cladding does we, come under the cladding thought, would... Because we thought with absolute no, no, assurances... No, no, just no sorry, the cladding would, but there's lots and lots of other things the that case. don't, yeah. that are very important and as Mr. well. And Mr Stewart, you wanted to add? Just really to follow up on the point about different standards, um, at the moment, um, I, I suppose it'd be fair to describe the private rented sector as having to meet slightly higher fire safety standards uh, than social landlords. And that really, I think, came about because they were seen as potentially more of a risk or, or having um, potentially some buildings that weren't so well kept or, or landlords that might not always be so responsible, a, a minority, obviously. The, the Scottish Government consultation, which came out at the end of last week, explores this and, and looks at having um, more common safety standards and fire safety standards for all tenures and I think that's something that we would broadly welcome and going back to my point about um, multis or, or other flat buildings often having mixed tenure really if you want to improve fire safety I think you need to have standards that apply to all tenures and Kenny's right as far as owner occupation you know that there isn't really any standard other than in new builds. So I think we welcome the the review and the possible harmonisation. Okay, that, that's all very helpful. I know there's other members itching to get in. Mm -hmm. I've not had the opportunity. And Mr. Whiteman may or may not be finished his lines of questioning. I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you, Appreciate sure. that, Graham Simpson. Mm. Thanks, I just want uh, I just want to uh, clarify uh, quickly three areas that we've already covered, and then I'll come on to my substantive point. Um, Denise. Um, you, you mentioned uh, intrusive inspections. I just want to be clear in my own head what you mean by that. Is that going in and actually taking materials from buildings, testing it? Is it going into individual flats and checking what's going on there? I don't think it's the job of the fire service to go in and take materials and actually test it. That will be the experts within the, the building construction area and the building prevention area. The, the audits will be firefighters uh, going into uh, buildings and looking at their fire safety procedures and precautions. The intrusive element of that will take a little bit more time, a little bit more detailed look in, looking into them, uh, the, 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 the safety of the building, the fire doors, the smoke detectors, uh, the, the heat detectors, if there's any issues in relation to um, uh, Eras within the within the actual building that's been directly impacted due to modern building um, reconstruction or or modern modern building um, identification that's 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 been put in place during that process. So the intrusive part of that will be actually going into the buildings and having a detailed look uh, within the, the the fire safety procedures, the fire precautions, the fire detections to make sure in relation to the actual testing of the materials. That's nothing that the fire service will do. That will be left up to the experts. OK. Uh, so that leads me uh, on to the next point, uh, testing of materials. And you talk about cuts in research. Um, who, who funds the research and where is it done? Where is it carried out? What's that? <coughs> well, I think it was Denise. <coughs> Denise. <coughs> Well, I, th I think the research comes from, from governments, government funding in, into that. And, of course, during the times of austerity, uh, we're seeing cuts right across the board to the public service uh, and within organisation, within governmental departments. 
So the research would be coming from that to test those those flammable, uh, potentially flammable materials that, that's newly coming onto the market. I think, I think most of these, most of the people who do the research now, like building research establishment, at one time would have been a, a, a government funded company or, a, or a partially funded through doing research for gov government departments, let's say, might even be non-for-profit. But I think a lot of these companies now have gone out and, and privatised themselves or set up their own private wing and been a fully accredited, respected throughout the world, testing um, to British standards and testing to certain standards. A lot of the fire test standards are very old. Um, they've not been seen to be anything wrong with them. They are quite old standards. And, and these, the, so these companies are reputable. Sorry, Mr. McKenzie, can I just stop you there? The, the, the evidence from the uh, FPU was that, that um, research into fire performance has been slashed uh, south of the border. That's correct. Um, so wh why, why is that? That, that, that must be a, a, a money thing. So where's the money coming from? Where's it going to? It, if it's government funded, is it the UK government? Do we have research here in Scotland? I'm certainly not, not aware of any research within Scotland, but maybe my colleagues within the building industry and construction industry and housing industry may, may, uh, may be able to alleviate on that. It, it sounds like we need more clarity. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. It's an absolute, yeah. It's okay. That, yeah. That's the point of having the evidence session to identify where we need more information and more clarity. Well, that, most, that's okay. Most of, uh, most of the testing of materials as such is driven by the manufacturer. That manufacturer wants to sell a cladding material. To get that on the market, it's got to pass water tests for rain screen cladding. No, that, that, that's not what we're talking about today, but that'll be one main criteria. It's got to be able to be fixed in such a way it doesn't get sucked off or blown off by the wind. So there's a structural aspect of it. And then there is also a fire aspect of it. The fire aspect of cladding up until this fire and that type of cladding appearing on the market was negligible because it's either been stone, metal, solid metal, which doesn't burn, terracotta type things. So it hasn't been a, a, a plastic. These rain stream cladding is mostly stone, a lot of it's stone. But, so that hasn't been an issue, but it has to be tested by an independent testing um, company who you can choose to go to. You, don't have, you can go to whichever one you want um, and you get your test certificate from that and that will last for a period of time. That is funded by that company paying that company money. That's, that's how the, that works. They, they, they may do independent tests now for the government, may have asked them to test certain materials or retest things, but they'll be putting a, a fee in, putting a bill in for that. These okay. testing companies are independent. They're not funded by anybody. They make their money out of testing materials. It's a business. Um, it's Right, it's obviously an area we'll, we'll have to look at yeah, uh, yeah. A, a bit further. Um, so can, can I ask, uh, sorry again, Denise, um, to go back uh, to your evidence where you say that fire safety inspecting officers have, have been cut um, by 24%. Um, do, do you think this means that things are being risk, uh, missed, uh, 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 risks being missed due to these cuts? Well, what I have to say is that, you know, my members of fire safety inspecting officers are absolutely doing the best job that they can um, with the resources that they've got. Certainly feedback from our members that they are finding it more and more difficult uh, to have the time to complete the tests uh, that that needs to be completed and, and, and inspections that needs to be that, that that required to be completed in the time and the allocation of time. Now I've not seen the figures of the, the, the recent um, audits in relation to fire safety inspections. I've not got them handy, but there are there are figures out there that will tell you how many audits have been done, how many hours it's took to cover those audits. Now if we're looking for an increase in audits, um, with a decrease in hours, that then shows you that less time is getting taken to do more audits, and and I would attribute the, attribute attribute that to less fire safety inspecting officers having the time to complete the audits. The audits still need to be completed, but the question I would ask, and I've not got these figures to hand, but I certainly there will be figures out there, and questions need to be asked: is how long is it taking now uh, uh, in this this current climate? 
to do those fire safety inspection audits to previously three, four, five years ago. And if there's a difference there, we need to be asking why. And if that's a direct result of the cuts to fire safety inspection uh, 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 auditors, then again, question needs to be, uh, to, uh, to be asked why in relation to that. Okay, thank you. Can I go on to ask about um, sprinklers? Because we, ha we haven't really touched on that yet um, to any great degree. Um, my understanding is that uh, all uh, modern tower blocks um, now have to have sprinkler systems fitted, but that doesn't apply retrospectively to older tower blocks. So you could have older tower blocks that don't have sprinkler systems, that don't have uh, modern fire suppressant systems, uh, not just sprinklers. Should should we should we actually be uh, insisting that there should be a full audit of all tower blocks? and making sure that they all have these systems in them, not just the modern ones. Anyone can answer. would be a, <clears throat> a good step forward. Um, I don't know if that could come in through building legislation. It perhaps could. <clears throat> it's difficult because, as I said, the way that the regulations are worded, um, you would have to then bring in legislation that you could apply certain standards in retrospect. There, there are powers through the Act that you could enforce it, but that, its power is very, 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 very rarely used. They've been used after a couple of football, football stadium disasters where we've gone to football stadiums and f discussed things and forced things to be done. But it, it would be the way forward, certainly, because under the current building regulations, end above 18 metres yeah. requires sprinklers. Sometimes developers will then keep things just under 18 metres so they don't have to go to that expense. Um, so you could bring that in in all flatted developments and retrospectively in all um, buildings that get altered above um, 18 metres. It would be certainly a, a, a positive thing to do, I'm sure, because um, certainly where sprinklers are used in, in any part of the regulations, they're used for life safety. They're used for property safety in schools but and other buildings, but mainly for life safety that we are very much in favour of them. A spring a suppression system, sorry. They're right. not just sprinklers. Which is not exclusive to, to sprinklers. Yeah. Yeah. Denise Christie. Yeah, thanks. Um, in 2009, the FBU moved a resolution at STEC Congress calling on the Scottish Government to um, install sprinkler systems uh, within uh, all the housing stock. Uh, and recently, the General Secretary of the STEC wrote to um, the Minister for Community Safety um, highlighting the STC's position in relation to sprinklers. And that resolution was written at a period where there was a, a high increase in fire deaths within Scotland. Uh, and the FBU priority, like I said before, has always been community safety and firefighter safety. Uh, recent stats show that there has been a decline in fire deaths within Scotland, but the recent stats shown a slight increase again. So whether that's a blip within the... Uh, within the, the level of fire deaths, we, I can't really comment on that, but I think we need to be aware that there is a slight increase within fire deaths in Scotland, and the recent stats show that you're more likely to die in a dwelling house fire in Scotland than anywhere else in the UK. And if we reflect on the Welsh legislation, uh, Wales have got legislation that requires sprinklers fitted, uh, uh, sprinklers uh, to be fitted, and we certainly have had no reports of any fire deaths where a house or a property or a building has been fitted with sprinkler systems, and I believe it potentially could cost between one and two thousand pounds to spread to, to, to fit any sprinkler systems in, in properties. Uh, the Welsh legislation is in all new dwellings. It's not retrofitting, is it? Just for clarity, I'm not sure. Yes, I think uh, it's new yeah. building. Right, so it's new yeah, building. It's not retrofit. So, sorry. So, David Stewart. Yeah, um, on that, um, I, I must admit that actually a discussion on whether sprinklers should be retrofitted or not in multis probably hasn't been one of the main issues that, that, that's come up um, amongst the, our, our members. Probably a lot of the focus has been on cladding, on internal fire doors and on work with the fire service and also how best to, to communicate with tenants. Um, it's something that maybe you know ought to be considered in looking at building standards, but also through the the current consultation that that's open. Um, 
the final thing I would say on it, going back to what I've been saying earlier around fire doors and around alarms, is I think any measures that, that are um, required uh, following uh, as learning lessons from Grenfell, I think, have to be applied to all all dwellings and all all tenures, at least for multi stories. Otherwise, you you know you're not they're not going to be as effective as as they might be. That's fine, thanks. Uh, Jenny Gorth. Thank you, um, Just to follow up, actually, on the convener's point earlier on, um, he highlighted that obviously not all of your members, sorry, this is to David Stewart, um, had responded to the survey that you'd sent out to them. And I just want to take you back in time and ask you how that evidence was gathered. Did S uh, SFHA staff go out and carry out the surveys themselves, or were you, was it dependent on members feeding back to you in terms of the survey? How did it... What was the process? It was really sent out very quickly, maybe a day or two after the, the Grenfell tragedy, and it was sent as an email from our chief executive asking uh, for members to, to respond. Okay, so it wasn't physical inspections carried out by you centrally then in terms of your members, no? No, no, it was asking members to provide information and then many of them carried out yeah, and you say now that all members though have responded to the government in terms of their investigations. Um, and has that process been similar? Do you know if they were again asked to respond to an email? I believe they were asked to respond to a letter, actually. A letter. So it was a, but it was a method of communication rather than understand the government actually yeah. going out and. So again, no physical them. inspections took place then. I believe that's the case, but okay. I think that's something you would maybe want to clarify with the ministerial working yep. group. Um, later on in your submission, you say that housing associations also made tenants aware that the fire service offered free advisory home visits. Can I ask why those aren't compulsory? Is that because of legislation? I don't know if this is perhaps for you, Denise. I, I, I could say something briefly on... Uh, yeah, um, yeah. yeah I, I believe they're not um, compulsory and the idea is that they should tend to focus on people who might be seen as more vulnerable. Um, one thing that's come up in discussions with, with one member is that um, they actually re require it as a condition of, of um, tenancy and in a way try, try to make it compulsory. So whether that's something resources permitting that might be followed up on or, yeah. or seen as good practice across landlords, uh, that might be something to, to consider. Okay. Yeah, I think I think it's important to recognise actually the 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 great deal of work the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service have done on the back of Grenfell in relation to going out into communities, uh, especially those residents living in high flats, giving them fire safety advice. Uh, they've updated their website in relation to fires within tower blocks and fire safety advice and, and giving out leaflets. So there's a great deal of work, certainly that I'm aware of, that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service are doing and I know the priority is to try and reach those hard to reach individuals uh, and work uh, across other organisations within social work, within health work to try and get access to difficult residents that potentially need that, uh, that life safe and fire safety advice. So I'd like to put on record the recognition of the, the work that the service have done on the back of Grenfell and, and my members certainly are doing uh, to, to give that, that, that uh, fire safety advice. This is a kind of a final <coughs> question. Um, I suppose my point is not to take away from any of that fantastic work, obviously, Denise, but um, because these visits aren't compulsory, people don't have to go through them. And, and I, I suppose there is a concern then that, you know, the most vulnerable people will miss out because those aren't the people that are going to be volunteering to have these advisory visits happen if they're hard to reach. Um, can I just ask what specific action then the SFHA takes centrally to go out in terms of fire inspection? Is there specific action you would take on the ground to support you know, these advisory visits, or is it, again, a letter or an email? Or I, I, It's not something we would really do in our role, as okay. we are really a, a membership and representative body. We, we don't own houses. Yeah. We represent members and tenants' interests, so, so we, don't, we don't have that, that role at all. OK, thank you. Okay. Can, can I just check something, then? Uh, do your members identify those most at risk who are tenants and work more closely with them to get them to engage with the, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Is that done as a matter of course or is it just each housing association has, has a different approach? 
it's difficult for me to give a direct answer to that without having you know, spoken to all or surveyed all, but what I would say is that of associations we've spoken to and I had a meeting yesterday with a number who have quite a few multi-stories, that does come across as common practice, that they're aware of people who who they would see as vulnerable and they very much encourage them to, to engage with the fire service. It also, just briefly, I, to add to what Denise said, um, I've been very impressed when members have come back to us with just them, um, what a positive working relationship they have with the, the fire service and how, how much work the fire service do to either engage with them as organisations or with their tenants as, as individuals. Yes, Denise, Glad to add to that. Um, the fire service work with partnership organisations, and those partnership or organisations will then inform the fire service of particular clients or residents who potentially could be high risk, and the fire service will go out and make every effort to, to target those individuals and, and gain access to their properties to give that fire safety advice. So there is partnership work in there, that collaborative work. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr Gibson, I don't know if you want to follow up on any of the points raised. Uh, I know Elaine Smith has got some additional points, so Elaine Smith. Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, one additional point to Denise. Um, you said in your evidence that the FBU is concerned we should not have to wait for another multi-fatality fire before we address other known risks with the same vigour. Are those known risks like the, the lack of fire doors, etc., or do you want to expand a wee bit on those known risks? Well, the... the I would argue that the known risks won't be known until we get those intrusive fire safety <coughs> ins inspections uh, uh, concluded. Uh, we never realised the impact of the cladding in relation to Grenfell Tower until after the tragedy, and then there's further intrusive investigations uh, and ministerial working groups and evidence sessions taking place like this one, rightly so. Uh, I think in order to find out what those... Uh, uh, unknown or, or, or known issues are, we need to make sure that we're going out there and doing those thorough, intrusive fire safety audits and inspe inspections and also have the resources to do those and carry out those inspections as well. Thanks. My worry was, Convener, that maybe there was risks that we knew about right now that we weren't mm. um, dealing with mm. and acting on. Could I specifically ask David Stewart a question? Um, when your members are uh, building new housing developments, whatever, do they regularly use their own clerk of works? This is something we've been taking evidence on, mm -hmm. or do they rely on the private contractor to, um, to for the quality assurance of those houses? Again, this is something um, I can't give a 100% answer without surveying members, but I've had quite a lot of discussions with members following issues that have come up, for example, around schools, buildings, and those that I have spoken to feel that sort of issue would be unlikely to happen to them because they do employ clerk of works. They have a lot of site inspections and site meetings. And certainly, a, when I worked for a housing association developing houses, we, we did employ a, a clerk of works on site. So it's not something to be complacent about, but I believe it's something that's still, still common practice. Can I just Yes, is that okay. possible just to come in? Uh, just to say that my experience is that um, when we were at the, the, the last discussion, that uh, the private sector nowadays, because they have to build a certain amount of affordable housing when they build so many of their own units, that invariably there is a clerk of works representing the house association who are taking on those affordable housing that's been supplied. So generally, I would say they do have clerk of works. Okay, but the thanks. private house builders don't. Thanks. Uh, and so finally, from me, convener, could I ask all of the panel members something that, again, takes us back to our original inquiry, which is um, the verification of building standards is something that we have been looking into, and we've taken evidence from bodies who believe that it's better in council control. We've also taken evidence from others who believe that it's better uh, provided by a private body such as the NHBC, for example, and I just wonder if the panel would wish to make any comment on that as part of our inquiry into the building standards regulations. Where do you think verification ought to lie? Do you have an opinion? No one's catch no one wants to answer that question. In a, in a totally biased position of, of being a verifier who works for a local authority. But I'll be honest, I, I'm not 
100% sure that it couldn't be opened up. And a lot of my colleagues will, will be looking at me saying, why are you saying that? But as a member of the RICS, I have lots of fellow members of the RICS who work in England and Wales, um, close friends, people I've worked with over the years who now work in private sector. Uh, sorry, work in the pub... Um, work in the private sector, sorry, who used to work in the public sector, and they are not any different. They're the same person and they've taken the same values. The same, if you're a member of the ISS, you're a member of that Chastity Institute, you've got strong, strict conditions of membership there that you've got to follow. And um, I think if you're a professionally qualified person, it wouldn't matter if you're in the private or the public sector. It works well in the private sector in Scotland, but. Yeah. Sorry, could I just clarify, it works well in the private sector in Scotland? But hey, sorry, in the public, in the public sector. sector, but it did work well in the private sector when there was, um, this was a private sector approved building. So, and that said, let's move on. Okay, on yeah, that. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Denise Christie. Yeah, I, I would just add caution uh, in relation to, you know, fire safety and fire safety inspections in relation to buildings going into the private sector, certainly within the fire service. Our members are firefighters that are professional, that are knowledgeable and that are experienced, that work within the fire industry from going into fires to eventually going into specific areas uh, in relation to fire safety and fire enforcement. Certainly know there's, there's talks about potential privatisation for, for some of these areas down in England and the Fabregas Union would definitely like to see those kept uh, in-house within the, the public, public bodies. A, a firm position one way or the other, other than to say, I think from our members' point of view, the, the big issue would be not so much who's doing the inspections, but that there's the resources and the, the people to actually carry out the, the sufficient number and the right quality of inspection. Thanks. Okay, might just mop up one or two very, very brief questions. Um, so we've spoken a bit today about uh, fire doors and properties, sometimes they were social rented, maybe they were bought over, they've been adapted and what have you. Um, that puts properties, uh, particularly with, with communal stairwells, other properties, it compromises their fire safety, not just the fire safety of that individual household. So is the suggestion then that it should be an offence to move a fire door from someone's private dwelling? And if so, there should be inspection of that, there should be enforcement and there should be penalty. What I'm trying to actually tease out is we can say these things but actually making it happen in practice can be much more challenging. So what's your thoughts on fire doors? It's clearly built buildings uh, go through the building warrant process, it's verified F fire service are delighted with the level of fire safety there 15 years later there's 10 properties, fire doors have been pulled out. Happens quite a lot in tenements where there's fire doors for internal kitchens and things like that, for example. No one's ever going to look at that property again unless unless what? How do we do something meaningful rather than just uh, uh, just malaise the fact that there's not a lot we can do about it? Denise Christie, what should we do? I, I think we need to invest in more preventative work rather than looking at the problem after it's happened. If we had more fire safety inspection officers uh, uh, with authority to, to go in and do those inspections and give that advice, then potentially we would see the issues coming from behind that where we are having fire doors that are being changed into modern doors that are not 30 minute doors or 60 minute door equivalent. So for me, it's about, and the Fire Brigade Union, it's about the preventative work we do before the issue occurs. So it's awareness raising and having people make positive choices for their properties yeah. rather than any form of, of legislation. Yeah. Is that the view of the other I panel think so, members? Yeah, definitely. I think certainly, you know, Grenville's, if it serves one purpose, you know, it's a very, very sad event, but if it does serve one purpose, it has heightened everybody's awareness. And I think people might be more aware now of wedging fire doors opened or, or whatever. Fire doors with young children, they're a nightmare. They are a nightmare. I've got grandchildren and I keep saying to no, my own children, don't, no, don't wedge your doors open. Then. But it is an awareness thing. But I think, I think it's, it's very difficult to police that situation. And, and in terms of the building legislation, the building regulations and the Building Act, our enforcement, one of the best things that any government could do would be to give the building control, building standards verification process 
some enforcement teeth. We have no enforcement teeth at all, and that would, that's across the board. That's across the board. Uh, that, that's the most positive thing that could be done in the building regulations because we have no enforcement teeth at all, and too many people know that and flaunt it. And that's why you get people occupying buildings without permission because that's against the law and it's not without the building standards people writing to them and telling them. We can withhold certification, but unless they maybe want to sell a property or get money on it, that doesn't work. Um, and that's where really the enforcement is very, very poor for building standards and it's enforcement would be a really good thing to okay, keep up. And because time's almost upon us, rather than expanding that further and talk about Sorry. enforcement, perhaps no, no, you'd no, like no, to no, us, no, it's just a statement. Perhaps, perhaps <laughs> like to us because we're looking at other, other matters as part of this inquiry, yeah. not, not just fire safety and yeah. high-rise. Um, we're, we're all, yes, Mr Stewart, I'm going to take you in next, but oh, we, time is almost upon us. In fact, time is upon us. We're, um, but I'd like the opportunity to give each of the witnesses any closing remarks that they might wish to make before we move on from this session. And I know you had a final comment to make anyway, Mr Stewart, so maybe start with yourself and yeah, the others I could come thanks. in after. I, I can maybe cover what I was going to say yeah. in answer to that question as part of the final remark. Um, our view, I think, um, would be that um, a way to address this issue of fire safety um, and internal doors fire alarms would be to have a, a common housing quality standard. It, it's something that the Scottish Government did some preparatory or investigative work on. And um, I think it would, um, it would have a number of benefits beyond just um, fire safety. Um, a lot of our members, a, a lot of people in the private sector have real issues with tenements falling into disrepair and not being able to effect repairs or improvements to common parts, um, having a common housing quality standard for all, all tenures would help with that. I, and finally, it would help um, where the, the government sets energy efficiency standards and social landlords or even private owners who might want to improve their property can't do that because they can't get other, other owners to, to agree. So that, that would be our proposal. Okay, thank you. Mr McKenzie? Yeah, I, I think there's, there's so much we've covered and it, it's been, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here. I, I think my view is that the, the current building standards in a, in a new building, Grenfell, wouldn't happen. I, even, I don't even think it would happen if um, the, the same cladding was on the building. I think, unfortunately, um, and I think it's came as much from the Scottish Government, but there's, there's been a a sort of stay put policy within buildings and that normally works and there, there's pictures that are on the BSD website of little units burnt out and the flat across from it the door's hardly blistered and the rest yeah. of the building's fine but when you get this issue with Grenfell with this cladding which hopefully will be banned and, and we won't have that ever again you, you have something different but I think the current standards are robust enough where you've got sprinklers perhaps alarm detection systems, internal fire doors, secondary fire doors, smoke ventilation, smoke control and lobbies and stairs. It should not have happened. People should have been able to walk away from that building and got out of that building. I don't know the whole story, but I think once we get the whole report, um, certainly the cladding is the, is the one eye-opener. That, that shouldn't have happened. And I don't think will happen, we've, we've done the, no checks and things and shouldn't happen hopefully anywhere in Scotland if it, because it will be rectified, it will be discovered now and be changed. But I think the building regulations are, are fairly robust. Um, I think more investment needs to be given across the board in whatever way we go um, because it's okay setting up policies and setting up documents and setting up things but unless you've got people to enforce these things um, the, 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 you won't be able to take it forward. And there's a huge lack of investment in local authority building standards. Um, the, the fees have gone up, but the still money can get siphoned off by the chief executives. And um, I think as well, it's not, it's not an attractive business to come into local government. If now we've got a um, colleague here who's uh, you know, representing a, a union as much as anything. If I can represent a local government union and be very political for a minute, is that people like myself who have been working at the top of a pay grade for about 10 years have noticed virtually no rise in their salary over 10 years. You're not going to encourage people to come into that profession. You're going to encourage people to leave and go into the private sector. Uh, so to get even 
if we had the policies in place to recruit staff is very, very difficult. And that, that's what you know, we are finding in Edinburgh City Council, I think, across the, the, the board. Uh, more people are going out the door than coming in. Well, I won't compare your salary with that of local authority chief executives. That's no, no, no. One, one for an, a, another day, Mr no, Mackenzie, no, but, no, but you make your point well. And talking about resources, that might lead on quite nicely to some of the comments that Denise Christie definitely. may have. I yeah, sure. Um, a couple of points, convener. The, the ministerial working group it focuses on the CLAD and the FPU would like to see that extended as a result of those uh, intrusive inspections uh, that happened in, Clam in Camden. So we would like them to consider to open up the, the ministerial working group and also reconsider uh, a seat on that working group for the Fire Brigade Union. Uh, and the second point I'd really like to highlight, I think I've highlighted it enough here, but I'm going to you know, go on again. It's in relation to the fire safety inspecting officers. Uh, that 24% reduction um, uh, within those inspecting officers, that can only be increased due to funding. Year-on-year -year cuts, year-on-year -year budget cuts to the fire and rescue service is impacting on the front line. We've got a, we've got a budget coming up. I'd like to see support round about um, uh, this committee, certainly, and I'm happy to, um, to, to, to speak at other further evidence sessions in relation to specific cuts in the fire service. And finally, I'd just like to thank the committee and the members for the opportunity to speak here today. Thank you. Um, can I just say one more brief thing? The building yes, Mr McKenzie, sorry, you can. The building standards uh, authorities have a fantastic relationship with Scottish Fire. Uh, we work very, very closely with them. We work at, particularly in complex buildings and, and um, difficult structures, and they're, they're involved at the early stage in the design of these buildings, the fire precautions, they put in their, their professional expertise, as we do as well, and, and, and work with the developers and the designers of these buildings. And also, at the small end, an enforcement of people using basements and shops that they shouldn't be using. And, and we work very, very closely with them, and we, we, know we, we, we appreciate their expertise, as they do also appreciate our expertise as well. Okay. Uh, can I thank all three witnesses for, for, for the, the, their time and considered evidence here today? Uh, I'm sure the Scottish Government will wish to be led by the evidence uh, through the Ministerial Working Group uh, and also informed by the evidence this committee receives. So we'll, 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 we will watch how that develops as a committee as well. And I think it's fair to say the committee is not having a one-off look at this matter. We intend keeping a, a watching brief on this as it unfolds, because this might run over a number of years, not just a number of months, and I think we'll be in it for the long haul to make sure that additional level of scrutiny is provided from this Parliament. So thank you to all of our witnesses for coming along uh, this morning, and we'll suspend briefly before we move to the next agenda item. Thank you. Thank you.
We, we now move to agenda item two, subordinate legislation, and the committee will consider negative instrument 225 is listed on the agenda. The instrument is laid under the negative procedure, which means that its provisions will come into force unless the parliament votes on a motion to annul the instrument. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform DPLR Committee considered this instrument at its meeting on the 5th of September 2017 and determined that it did not need to draw the attention of the parliament on any grounds within its remit. Uh, I can inform members that no motions to annul have been laid. Can I ask members if they have any comments on the instruments before us? Uh, there appearing to be no comments on the instrument. I can invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument, and are we agreed on that? Okay, thank members for that, and we'll now move to agenda item three, which will be in private. A consideration of evidence will now move into private session.